The Black Island is the seventh adventure of Tintin, created by Hergé. First published weekly for a Belgian newspaper between April 1937 and June 1938, the comic was redrawn and colorized in 1943 and redrawn again in 1966. In Britain, which is where most of the story takes place, it was adapted into a theatre play in 1980, and was the first of 11 adventures adapted for radio in 1992. 53 years after its first publication, The Black Island was the sixth Tintin adventure produced for the animated television series of the same name. How faithful was this adaptation? Let's spot 20 of its differences. The reason the comic was redrawn in the mid-60s was actually done at the request from publishers in England wanting to translate The Black Island. Georges Remé's artwork had become much more detailed in the post-war years. Instead of empty walls, he'd fill rooms with framed pictures, bookshelves, wallpaper and so on. But specifically, it was the various vehicles seen in the comic they wanted Hergé to modernise, such as the fire engine and the trains, replacing the steam-powered ones with electric and diesel engines. However, in this adaptation, the two trains and taxi Tintin uses are old-fashioned, which may have been because the Canadian studio who produced this television series used a second edition copy of The Black Island, but that doesn't explain why some of the background designs, such as Dr. Muller's estate, are based on the third edition. While strolling in the countryside with his dog Snowy, the young sleuth Tintin sees an aircraft with engine trouble. He approaches to offer assistance, only to be shot by the pilot. Waking up in hospital, he is informed by detectives Thompson and Thompson that a plane matching his description crashed in the English village of Eastdown. In the comic, the Thompsons are informed the plane has crashed by a phone call after getting Tintin's statement. There is a real village in the county of Devon called Eastdown, but not in Sussex, which is where Hergé sends Tintin. Leave the investigation to us! Whoa! Evan, gracious! Here, why don't you watch where you're going? But I was following you! Why don't you watch where I'm going? But I was following you! Tintin is accused by a man with a great big bushy beard of stealing his wallet, and as it was planted in his coat pocket while he was asleep, the Thompsons have no choice but to arrest him. Again. With help from Snowy, Tintin escapes the defective detectives, and soon crosses the channel with help from a ferry. Ivan the chauffeur and henchman to Pushoff and Dr. Muller does not appear in the adaptation. Instead, all of his dirty work is done by an unnamed cousin of Inspector Cluzo, who was given Ivan's name in the episode. Give it up, Tintin! You're still under arrest! You can't outrun the long arm of the law! <laughs> Snowy's effort to save Tintin by distracting Pushoff and Ivan with a raging goat almost results in what the villains were attempting to achieve, Tintin falling off a cliff. In the comic, although he does fall backwards to avoid the charging horns, he lands on the grass, not the cliff edge. Discovering that a certain Dr. Muller, or Mueller as the Canadians called him, is involved with the mysterious plane that almost killed him, Tintin is caught snooping around the grounds of the villain's home, resulting in our hero passing out from breathing in a smashed bottle of chloroform, and Muller accidentally setting his house on fire. 
A comedic sequence absent from the episode involves the local fire brigade having to catch a magpie that has flown away with the key to the fire station. This is Dr. Mueller speaking. I have a patient here. He is to be a permanent guest. That is correct. Prepare the special medication. There. No! Here! Muller sees no choice but to allow his mansion to burn to the ground with Tintin roasted inside, and so cuts a hole in the firefighter's hose. Doing so soaks the villain in the comic, and after Ivan punches the fire chief, the two men flee. These two moments do not happen in the adaptation, and the much more notable difference, worth highlighting, is the sequence takes place at nightfall rather than daylight. Saved from the fire, Tintin is awoken once again in hospital by the Thompsons, who have come to apologise, somehow now knowing Tintin was framed for the theft and almost murdered. In the comic, it is the fire chief who is at Tintin's bedside. Well, you get some rest, Tintin. Yes, leave everything to us. Precisely, Thompson. Oh. Here, why do you watch where you're going? Exploring the grounds, this time without interruption, Tintin discovers red beacons, deducing they are for signalling an aircraft. That night, a plane drops three sacks containing forged banknotes, one of which lands on Muller's head. Ivan makes a run for it, but surrenders when Tintin almost shaves his head with a bullet, triggered by a discarded rake he stepped on. It is Ivan in the episode who gets a blow from above, for the second time, while Muller is put to sleep by the rake. Well, once the police get here, these forgerers will be looking at a long holiday, behind bars. Tintin returns to the burnt manor, having left to call the police, to find the villains are escaping. Ivan used a knife to cut through the wire binding them, which was changed from the comic's much more complex method, as the two men struggling against the wires caused a short circuit, causing the wires to sizzle and snap. Hitching a lift with a passing caravan, the trailer attachment breaks, resulting in Tintin being given a fine by a passing police officer for camping on private property without permission and splashing in a no-swim zone. The constable doesn't appear in the adaptation, and it is the runaway caravan that causes Muller and Ivan to crash their car into a tree unlike the comic, where no explanation is given for the villain's smashing diversion. Snowy! What is it, Snowy? <laughs> Our hero chases them onto a train, but Muller and Ivan escape again by uncoupling the engine from its coaches. Snowy snatches a whole cooked chicken as he and Tintin run through the restaurant car. In the episode, Tintin tells his little furry companion to leave it behind as they follow the engine on foot. In the comic, Tintin does not acknowledge Snowy's bird, and soon after walking down the line, they manage to jump aboard a passing goods train, whereupon the young man and his dog both chew the chicken. Beg your pardon. Never a proper hello, never an excuse me, never a polite goodbye. Hello, excuse me, ma'am. Goodbye. The largest section of the comic not included into the adaptation is only three pages out of 62 long. Beginning as Tintin and Snowy leave the uncoupled train to pursue after the villains, the tanker full of whiskey they travel on has a small leak which Snowy starts drinking, unbeknownst to Tintin, until he is drunk. Our hero orders his dizzy dog to track down Muller and Ivan, but he sniffs out a pub's whiskey barrel instead. 
However, Snowy was half right, as the men they are chasing are inside the pub. But unfortunately, so are Thompson and Thompson, who still haven't forgiven Tintin for handcuffing the twin twits to each other. The young man begs the detectives not to arrest him until he has caught the crooks he's close to catching, which they agree to only because if Tintin is telling the truth, they can take the credit. We have reason to suspect that Moolah and his henchmen are on the train. No kidding. And now they're probably on a plane. What plane? That plane! Ah! Our heroes arrive at an airfield just in time to be buzzed by the villains escaping in an airplane. Tintin persuades a pilot, how is not said or shown, to fly him after Muller and Ivan. Due to thick fog, the pilot insists they land but due to poor visibility, crashes into a small wall. In the episode, Tintin is flying the plane himself, which from previous adventures we know he knows how to do, and the crash is not seen, allowing the moment to be used for one of this series' dramatic fade-outs. Thompson and Thompson join Tintin in the air by forcing a poor mechanic, who they assumed knew how to fly a plane. An amusing short sequence follows where the detectives get to experience some aerial acrobatics until the inevitable crash. In the comic, the detectives are airborne for two days, and their very bumpy landing happens after they accidentally join an air show. Tintin wakes up in the home of a Scottish crofter, with his clothing torn from the crash. The wee laddie was not rendered unconscious once flown from the tumbling plane, and the only injuries he received were to his clothes, being ripped by the brambles he landed in. By the way, given Dr. Muller's house was located near the south coast of England, it would take at least two or three hours to fly to the far north of Scotland, which is the setting Hergé pictured the final quarter of the Black Island to take place. Looks like you weren't the only one to go down. That's Muller's plane. You claim you know the poor lost souls. Yeah, I know them all too well. In the village of Kiltock, Tintin is informed by an off-duty private Fraser about the Beast, who bides on the Black Island, an offshore castle. Loud, distant thumping noises attributed to the Beast are heard echoing through the open window of the pub. These thumps were replaced in the adaptation by an ominous faint roar. Of course, Tintin goes to investigate. He's doomed! Doomed! Exploring the seemingly deserted Black Island, Tintin meets the Beast, a snarling gorilla. He also finds Pushoff, Muller, and Ivan. There is yet another nameless henchman in the comic, who Tintin knocks out with the butt of an empty gun once he and Cluzo's cousin start shouting for help. He immobilizes the two named villains using a large ink roller. Pushoff pretends to go mad with fear when Tintin confronts him with a now loaded gun, only to attempt to snap Tintin's leg once he lets his guard down, only to be kicked in the jaw with said leg. Ranko the gorilla unlocks his own cage, Tintin stones himself, and Snowy scares the gorilla away by barking. This scene does not happen in the episode. <laughs> that should keep him inside until the tide finishes him off. <laughs>
Using the Money Forger's radio transmitter, Tintin contacts the police, who arrive just as Snowy causes Ranko to roll down the castle's spiralling staircase and land on the villains. As soon as the Thompsons arrive, everyone returns to Kiltok, where the locals are already announcing to the press that they always knew the rumoured beast was just a giant monkey. I knew all along it was something of that description. Before leaving the island in the comic, our hero continues to explore the castle with the Thompsons, discovering a plane, more bags full of forged money, and a large patch of sand the forgers were using for an airfield. Are you certain he's not dangerous? Ranko? Nah, he's harmless. <laughs> The final four pages of the comic are filled with misfortune for Thompson and Thompson. Both detectives fall into the sea upon arriving on the Black Island. Tintin trips down the steps and lands on them. They fall into the sea again, this time upon returning to Kiltok. And the last moment of indignity is that their bowlers are once again blown off their heads when waving goodbye to Tintin, who is flying home to Belgium. Oh, <laughs>